Thank you for joining us here on Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And each week on Ask a Historian, we invite you to send in your questions, your curiosities, as we explore the history of the city of Mississauga together. Throughout November, we're going to be looking at and examining some of Mississauga's connections over time to the war years and to the theme of remembrance. So we do invite you to send in your questions around remembrance as we explore our city's military connections together. Thank you. So joining us this week on Ask a Historian is, uh, is Rob Stanchik and Justine Lynn. Rob is the curator for the Museum and Archives of the Polish Armed Forces here in Mississauga, and Justine is the volunteer curatorial assistant. And uh, they've had a hand in uh, the Our Boys exhibit that's taking place in Mississauga, both at the Anchorage and at the Benares Visitor Center as part of the museums in Mississauga. And so thank you, Rob and Justine, for, for joining us this week. And uh, highlighting the connections uh, to uh, your museum and archives and the ongoing theme of our boys and remembrance in, in Mississauga. So I uh, just wondering if you can tell me a little bit about, there's probably a lot out there that uh, haven't heard of the museum or connected with it in the past. Uh, Rob only, I, I can't even remember, was about a year ago that you introduced yeah. me to the museum. Uh, and so uh, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, the museum and, uh, and what you do and, and uh, how to find you. Yeah. So yeah, so we are located in Bawa Villa, which is the Polish retirement home, which is located not too far from your actually. It's actually located just a bit down the street from Benares Visitor Center. Um, so as I said, we are a Polish retirement home and there's many veterans uh, here that live here, a lot of Polish veterans um, after the Second World War. And one of the um, founding members of Bawa Villa was actually a gentleman called Michael Kominek, which was actually also a veteran that served with the 1st Armored Division under the 1st Canadian Army. So him and, um, and along with others just had this idea that, you know, we should start this kind of place here. But it wasn't until a gentleman called Boleso Korlinski, which was also a um, veteran himself, and he had the idea that you know, we should uh, create a museum here at Bawa Villa to kind of uh, preserve a memory of a lot of these veterans because there was always uh, some kind of fear. It's like, okay, what happens when, um, you know, the memorabilia goes away mm -hmm. or if veterans die, like, where's all that gonna go? So Orlinski left uh, some money in his will when he passed away and when he died in 1992. And about 10 years later, uh, the museum was founded uh, which was by the former head curator, which was George Kowalczyk, and another um, veteran called Krzysztof Szydłowski. So that's why uh, the museum is affectionately um, called the Orlinski Museum, kind of in his honor. Yeah, and the collection that consists of, you know, objects, photographs, mm -hmm. archival documents, um, and one of the things I really love about our collection is that, you know, we'll have an object and then we'll have, um, mm -hmm you know, photos of that veteran using the object and documents of that veteran. So we have all these different things to kind of connect. Um, and also too, a lot of our artifacts come from all around the world, not just Mississauga, not just Clarkson um, specific. They come from all over the world because, um, you know, a lot of these people were in Poland, they were in Britain, they were in, um, you know, Monte Cassino, they were in all these different places. So. Um, I think we're kind of unique in that way. And, and the, the material itself, uh, forgive me if I have this as wrong, my impression of it was most of it came as donations from people that were connected to Huawei Villa um, mm -hmm. and, and to the activity of, of starting a museum up. So you, 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 it wasn't the museum going out and actively collecting, it was stuff that was coming into you, right? Is that, that's uh, yeah. yeah, fascinating. Yeah, we very much yeah, we very much formed out of necessity almost. Um, yeah. yeah, because people were kind of giving us stuff and it was like, well, we need to make a museum out of this, you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly, yeah. So yeah, at first uh, it came up as a necessity, but then once um, people not part of the retirement home, just uh, you know, around the area also started donating some of their stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So we would have um, some memorabilia from uh, veterans from Toronto and they St. Catharines as well. So it just kind of tried to preserve just um, Polish Canadian veterans just in general yeah. as well. So 
as kind of like a collective strategy. Yeah, I mean, and also too, we've yeah. also, we don't necessarily only collect from Polish people. Um, it's yeah. not like necessarily a prerequisite. I mean, even uh, my dad, he was like, oh, I, you know, I'm gonna mm -hmm. donate. Uh, he has the Solidarność pins from the 1980s and he's not Polish, he's Canadian, but it's this Polish Canadian connection that we're kind of really interested in. Right. Yeah, which was really uh, interesting because like the solidarity movement in Poland, which you know, was in the 1980s when, you know, people were uh, trying to get independence from, you know, communist government at the time. So it was just nice to see that connection in Canada with like mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one thing that my dad was saying, like at the time, you know, no one knew what would happen. So he remembers just, um, you know, watching the TV and uh, you know, he went to Arendelle College, now UTM, um, University of Toronto Mississauga okay. campus. Um, and he remembers people in the hallways just kind of being like, oh, like, did you hear what, what's going to happen, yeah. you know? Um, but, and yeah, and people would wear these Solidarność pins um, uh, that actually had like a Canadian maple leaf on them to show that Canadians supported Polish people, right. Polish independence. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, so there's a lot of different ways that we can go with it. Um, but yeah, no, but basically we're all about this Canadian um, and Polish connection, right. if you will. And do you, uh, I mean, the, the days of COVID, for lack of a better term, have, uh, uh, you know, hampered the normal activities of, of museum and visitors, particularly, I mean, you're in a long-term care facility or a retirement home, uh, so that's going to impact any kind of uh, uh, connections from the public at this point in time. But, um, I mean, ideally, in a, in, a, in a reopened world, people will be able to come and see these, these exhibits again, right? So this is the, the idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's uh, the plan. Yeah, we try want to, yeah, once we come back to a normal world, we want to, um, you know, bring people in, uh, you know, showcase our collection. Um, Justine and I have been, well, before everything happened, we've been kind of rotating the exhibitions a bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, during the COVID times, uh, the way I try to stay a bit active is uh, just mostly scanning a lot of the archival documents. Mm -hmm. So like every now and then I'll go grab a binder and, or actually no, I grab like three or four binders because I can't go there that often. And I'm just scanning away at home because we have so much archives to scan. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah, but the and great then, thing about that yeah. is that the more work that we're doing behind the scenes like that, the more we have to share with the public um, yeah. because as long as it's digitized, then you know, I can go in and do an Instagram post about that or something like this. So we can then share it to the public. So our social media has been actually really active yeah. recently um, because we're, we haven't been in the office. So we're just like, okay, well, well, I don't know, like, what's your favorite artifact? Okay, let's share it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, okay, like, okay, so today is the anniversary of such and such. Let's do a post about it. Right. Um, so yeah, so we are really active on, um, you know, on Instagram, Facebook, um, whatever not we. Yeah, and then we have our, yeah, we have a passport online page. We can try to um, add, add on to it. So we're still working through our database. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically our online collection. So people can go there and look up different artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot more information on that than we would typically share in like, for, for example, Facebook or Instagram post. Um, so, you know, and you can click like related records and you know, someone's right. biography. So yeah, it's a really great, yeah. great tool. Yeah, we so yeah, we try to keep busy during COVID times. Mm -hmm. For sure. And people through, through and we'll share the Instagram link uh, at, at the end as well, so people can know how to get in touch with you and, and follow that. But um, you are also uh, an archives uh, and a resource uh, as well. And yeah. I, I know from my visit there, you have a, a resource library as well. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming, um, I'm putting you on the spot here, but people can send inquiries into you. Uh, Yes, yeah. Looking for information. And, and, and yeah, yeah. So I would say actually a lot of people have yes, been. From Poland, you know, from Canada. Yeah, yeah, from Ireland, right? Yeah, from There's Ireland. one guy. Yeah. yeah um, and so if you know who you are, shout out to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I know. So, and it's hilarious. It's like so many people are messaging us, and we actually you know, we get talking with these people and yeah, I mean, it's great. Time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like full on conversation yeah, yeah. and it's great. Um, and you know, we like to do research for people, um, as well. Sometimes, you know, um, someone will be trying to find out more about their father's regimen. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we can help with that, we're going to help with that. Right. Um, because at the end of the day, we're serving the public. So, um, yeah. really no matter where they are, um, you know, if they're coming to us virtually, like we're going to, we're going to help them.
that's, uh, that's excellent. And, and, you know, potentially that's also a way to engage with your home community as well as you grow and as people become more aware, you invariably have, uh, you know, uh, Polish ancestry in Mississauga is one of the larger yeah. demographics and, and uh, um, I'm sure that there are countless people that have looked at doing genealogy and uh, their mm -hmm. own family connections to, to Poland and to the military history of, of, of their past involvement. So, no, yeah, kudos and let's, you know, let, 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 let's share uh, the resources and put people in touch with you and... Uh, uh, yeah, and, it, and it's great because, you know, some of the yeah, that, you know, the center from Polish Canadians, like, they don't speak Polish that well, so mm -hmm. they actually come to us, like, maybe with, like, Polish documents, and we have myself or the curators just kind of help them out with that, because mm -hmm. their, you know, ancestors' uh, military records are in Polish, and they want to know which division they're in, yeah. so they all get the information, you know, from us, which is great. So, That's yeah, that was very nice to have some engagement, and, you know, yeah. Stuff, yeah. Oh, fantastic. I, I, I'm delighted. So from uh, kind of the broader public and the background of the history itself, you found yourselves involved in uh, the, uh, the theme of remembrance in Mississauga, uh, particularly that about the Arboys exhibit. And uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you became involved in that? And then we can go into kind of the highlights of, of, of that involvement and who it is that you shared the stories of. So uh, how did you get involved with Arboys? Yeah, so how we got involved with Arboys. So um, I did... So I'll just back up a bit. So the first kind of um, exhibition that I did here was with another curator with Stan. So when I was working as a collection assistant, Stan uh, reached out to me and then we formed kind of a really like a partnership uh, there. And that's actually when I got involved with the Museum of Archives of Yeah, Yeah, courses. yeah. So at the time he was working as a collections assistant with museums in Mississauga, yeah. where we are right now. Um, and I also um, work there. Well, we both work here as well. Um, and yeah, and so they reached out to us, um, right. and then that's how, yeah. how Rob got involved. And then he, yeah. Rob, he dragged me into it. So. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, fast forward, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, I reached out to Megan and I told her, you know, we do have some great stories, uh, of, uh, some, uh, veterans that live in Valvia. Mm -hmm. They have a missile connection. And that uh, we can really contribute uh, to this exhibition. So we yeah. thought it would be a very good partnership. Uh, and also just to kind of really showcase the collection the museum as well. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Megan Wiles. She, sure. uh, yeah, she's the um, exhibition um, coordinator at yeah. Museums of Mississauga. And um, yeah, and so she helped us like put together a lot of like these text panels and yeah. everything. Yeah. So she, she helped us a lot with this exhibit for sure. Phenomenal. And then the material I can see behind you. Um, yeah, uh, I yes, see the, uh, it looks like a naval uniform. Um, yeah. And that these are from your collections as well. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. We have uh, yeah the naval uniform yeah. of a gentleman called Tominsky, which we are going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, we have a painting in the back here of this person with mustache here. Yeah. Uh, very nice mustache, I should say. <laughs> uh, his name is uh, Joseph Pisutti, which was he was very um, instrumental in Poland's independence. And then, uh, yeah, there's this other here. We got a model of a plane, and then around here also got like a um, uh, an RAF uniform. You RAF can't really uniform. see can't that. Can't see that. Yeah, and then behind Rob's head, um, <laughs> yeah, there's like the Polish like blue army yeah. outfit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this so that was like one of the. This is more inspiration to have people come and see it. So this is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, we, we can't show everything in this video, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's just like a little bit of, of what we talked about. But, and I also too, um, because I kind of um, did the exhibition installation and kind of how it would look and feel, design, if yeah. that makes sense, the design. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so I kind of, you know, I tried to like, you know, put some things so at different angles, you can see different things and you can like look crouch down and stuff like that. So there's kind of, stuff you know um yep. to see everywhere not not to say it's like too crowded well, hopefully not but um, but you know what i mean it just um like a variety of different artifacts to choose from so well, so uh, you, you mentioned uh orlinsky by name and that you wanted to talk about them i wonder if we can make this a, a segue into that and uh, yeah. tell us about some of the highlights of uh, of uh of your collections connections to our boys whether that's a bad segue or not but uh uh, the people that you talk about and, and kind of explore the little bit of the stories of the individual. Yeah. So we talk, um, so 
Uh, we talk about three main things in this exhibit, yeah. um, which Rob can speak a bit more to. Um, and then yeah. afterwards, we can go into a little bit more detail. Yeah. 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 yeah so uh, the first, the three things that we kind of highlight in this exhibition. So one kind of talks about the Polish Blue Army. And one of the reasons why we wanted to um, highlight this topic is because it has a very good connection to Canada. So what the Polish Blue Army was, it was an army that was tra trained in a place called Camp Kostruszko, which is located in Niagara on the lake. Okay. And uh, the story kind of goes is that um, there were some representatives from the United States and they came to Canada because um, they wanted to make a Polish army. But um, America at the time wasn't in the war, but Canada was. Right. So they really advocated for a um, army there because just to put some uh, context is that um, during the sorry, uh, during the First World War, uh, Poland didn't really have you know a country, right? The Polish armies were uh, divided into different kind of mm -hmm. empires and countries. So, you know, one would be under the German Empire, one would be under the Russian mm -hmm. Empire, and Austrians, and and then you have this Polish Blue Army that was founded in Canada and they'll be fighting in. Friends, but it's really interesting because a lot of these Polish soldiers were trained by Canadians, and a lot of them were actually already being trained in secret in um, University of Toronto. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the things we want to just highlight here because that has a very good uh, game connection. And yeah, the other gentleman that we um, highlighted was Bolesław Wolinski. He was a World War One and World War Two veteran, um, and he uh, lived in Valvila, which was very and he was very instrumental in founding the Orlinsky Museum. And then we talk about also um, Ramul uh, Tuminski, who's the person with the <laughs> uniform there. Yeah. And his kind of biggest highlights, he saved uh, 85 Canadians in the Dieppe uh, raid there. Mm -hmm. um, just need to get to talk more about him yeah. after, but he did also live in uh, Valvila as well. So he also donated a lot of his things and really advocate for veterans getting a lot of their memorabilia to the Right. Um, I, I'm sorry, you, you, you dropped the, the bombshell of saving 80 Canadians at Dieppe. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to learn more. How? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I, yeah, so I can talk a bit more to that. Um, so Ramon Tuminsky, so his, um, uh, his uniform is right there. Uh, so he was born in 1905 in Poland and he was in the Polish Navy. He graduated from the Polish Naval Academy in uh, Turun in uh, 1928. Um, and at the um, beginning of the Second World War, so, you know, we know Poland falls. Um, and so he, many Polish had to escape at that point. Um, so he escapes on a sailing ship called the Iskra and he goes to Casablanca and uh, eventually makes his way uh, to Britain. And in Britain, he becomes the second commander of the Buscovica. Okay, now this is like kind of a little bit of an inside, but it's really cool. So the Buscovica is actually um, the sister ship of the HMS Hyeda, which is the, a Canadian ship and yeah. is um, a floating museum dock in uh, Hamilton. And the Buscovica is actually now also a floating museum in um, uh, in Poland, so they're kind oh. of both sister ships and also yeah. both sister museum ships. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of really cool. But so he was so he was on the Buskavica and he was in the Norwegian campaign and the Battle of Dunkirk. Um, and in 1942, he becomes the commander of the ORP Flazak, um, and that was a destroyer. And um, it was at this time that he was in the DF raid in mm -hmm. France. And um, I found this really interesting um, uh, kind of these memories from this one um, veteran named Joe Ryan. He was a Canadian um, in the Royal Regiment of Canada. Um, and he was there that day. And he remembers um, that no one did more than he did to get the Canadians out that day. Um, mm -hmm. So Ryan didn't know this at the time, but he actually went against orders. Um, when this happened. So there was a whole bunch of uh, ships there and they were all told like, you know, don't go close to shore because then they would be in line of the fire. So they were told, you know, not to uh, go close to the shore. Um, but, you know, he's 
Chaminsky is seeing all of these poor Canadians mm -hmm. trapped on the beach and they, they have no way out. Like they're just being surrounded. They have no way out. Right. So he goes and um, heads straight for shore, guns blazing. I mean, this guy is so cool. And um, and then he, um, Ryan talks about how he, how he like abruptly turned and there's mud and rocks and water flying everywhere, you know, and then the, and then the Canadians get on and uh you know and then they hightailed it out of there um and and only later did he find out that uh Tominsky totally get, went against orders like he was not supposed to do this he could have well obviously been killed um the ship could have been sunk he could have been court-martialed like mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that could have happened to him and heck he wasn't even Canadian himself he was right. Polish yeah. so he he really didn't like he didn't have to yeah. do that at all um and he but that just kind of shows the type of person that he was you know um and after the war he he went kind of all all around the world he was in um pakistan he was in um bahamas um in in their navies and um in the 1980s he moved to canada and uh, he actually lived at Val Vila as well um but he didn't just like he he actually continued to um, you know make life in Canada even better. So he was part of the uh, Canadian branch of the Polish Naval Association. In fact, he was instrumental in founding that. Um, and then he was also part of the Canadian Royal Regiment um, of the, the Veterans Association. Um, and he also wrote a couple books. Um, and yeah, so he died in two thousand three in Bala Vila. Um, and yeah, so he, you know, started off Polish. And by the end of his life, he was a very proud Polish Canadian. And uh, he was very much hailed as a hero in both uh, Poland and in Canada for his actions during the war. And it's just crazy to me because, I mean, I'm born and raised in Mississauga and yeah. I never heard about this. I have not and either. It's, other than it's amazing. The... And he literally lived right in Mississauga. Um, so I, I think it's a really yeah, great story that we're telling you. Yeah, even I didn't know, like, um, <laughs> even though I'm, you know, Polish myself, born in Poland, uh, was practically raised in Canada, and then I learned most of these stories actually joining this museum. Yeah. So I'm very thankful that the curator will able to tell me uh, about these stories. Like, I didn't know about Kaminsky and, yeah. you know, Kaminsky yeah. and, you know, this gentleman. So it's actually quite, you know, Yeah, oh, nice. it's been a learning experience, yeah. especially for myself. I'm not Polish-Canadian. <laughs> I'm just Canadian. And <laughs> so, you know, it, it's been a really huge learning curve and, but it's been great. It's been a really great learning experience. And Tominsky's story is, in my opinion, like one of my favorite stories out of, out of our museum. Um, and I really connect to it as a Canadian. Um, but yeah, so. <laughs> it, it, it's powerful. And it's a story, it, it, like you said, it's not just a story about, you know, uh poland during the war this is a story that touches here at home too i mean this this, this individual's life and time spanned uh an incredible story um and uh, uh you know brought him at the close of his life to mississauga i mean this, this is kind of a, a neat thing we should be we should be celebrating this and uh mm -hmm. connecting yeah. with this and i mean it kind of brings it full circle no like he saves all these canadians and then he ends up becoming a canadian himself I yeah. think that's such a cool story. <laughs> but but all, but also the uh, Orlinsky who you talked about first. I mm -hmm. mean, how many people served in both world wars? I mean, this is, yeah. you know, uh, you talk about uh, a desire to serve. Um, uh, whatever the whatever the motivations would be, like whatever drew him to do that. I, I mean, he knew. You know, you can you can say you know there's a sense of adventure and it's the brave young men who served for the enlisted in the first world war. In the second world war, he knew what he was getting into. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, yeah. it's kind of uh, technically he was actually part of even like a third war because yeah. there's also an interwar period where Poland was actually in a war with the Soviets as right. well. Right. So yeah, he enlisted in like during the First World War, he enlisted with the oh. Russian army because again, you know, I guess that part where he um grew up was part of Russia. Mm -hmm. And then when Poland gets independence in nineteen eighteen, he joins the Air Force and that's how he got into it. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and then during the Second World War, um, he, he was a bit, well, it was considered older at the time. I think he was like late in his 50s, so mm -hmm. they wouldn't let him be a fighter pilot. Um, so he became more of like an instructor and 
um, you know, teaching other pilots how to fly. But then finally, he did get his wish and became a bomber pilot okay. for one of the RAF squadrons. Mm -hmm. And uh, he became a wing commander. And that was kind of his most contributions. But what did, do you know what, what, what kind of bomber he flew? Uh, it was the D. Haviland uh, yeah. Mosquito. I okay. think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. D. Haviland yeah. Mosquito. <laughs> it's actually interesting because after the war, when he settled in Mississauga, he actually continued working for a factory there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the De Havilland factory uh -huh. in Toronto. While well, he was still, while well, he was living in Mississauga, so um, yeah, so he, it, you know, the um, planes were like, kind of like his entire life. Like, yeah, he was. Them. Yeah, he was a test yeah. pilot. He competed in a lot of competitions. Yeah. He was in uh, Cleveland, where he was uh, advertising a lot of the new Porsche planes that are being made and then he loved he won a lot of the races in 1920s yeah yeah, yeah but in um 1926 yeah. um uh, was kind of his what people most know him for um which rob can talk a bit more yeah about. so in 1926 he completed what they call the first transcontinental flight so on kind of i think it was a biplane um he flew from uh, warsaw poland all the way to tokyo japan which was i believe uh well back there and back, I think it was a one month trip. Yeah, one month trip. Wow. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing he's mostly associated with. So it's yeah. him and his mechanic, Leon Kubiak. And for doing that uh, flight, he was awarded the highest, um, I guess, military order in Japan, which was the Order Rising yeah. Sun, which we actually have a copy of certificate in our collection, which is really great. Um, mm -hmm. But the one thing is when he was going back, he um, had, I guess, kind of accident and the propeller cracked and part of the plane just broke so they had to use glue and wire to kind of repair it so um so yeah. i think when they were flying back it's i think um what was it both of their wings was like at half so it's like well yeah 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 well because i think one yeah. of the wings it got damaged so it was shorter yeah. than the other one so then they had to go and shorten the other one yeah to so make i guess the, the wind resistance wouldn't mess up yeah the, yeah yeah and can you imagine it's like you have to do this all while you're on this like big journey um and you only have glue and wire <laughs> yeah but from what i heard because i never knew or anything myself but uh, the other curious did know him and they always said that he was a very nice person very mm -hmm. supportive of um you know people just learning about polish history or even polish canadians of that ancestry just learning about their mm -hmm. heritage um that's why he actually set up a fund um to actually promote that so if anyone had a research project they want to do they can apply to this grant kind of mm -hmm, thing mm -hmm. and also a lot of the money like i said earlier went into founding this museum yeah yeah so, so that's so that's why it so it's basically his wish that eventually there would be a museum yeah. that would be kind of more officially founded for this that purpose right. um and so that's why when it was founded about 10 years after his death yeah. um uh you know it was very much affectionately known by all the residents as the orlinsky museum i mean a lot of these residents like would have remembered him and stuff so um yeah so to this day to be honest like we honestly when we were going back and forth talking about it, we call it the orlinsky museum, museum yeah like technically <laughs> It, it, the official name is the Museum and Archives of the Polish yeah. Armed Forces, but we just love the story of Orlinsky, so, yeah. um, and we love to kind of carry on that tradition <laughs> of affectionately calling it the Orlinsky Museum, you know, like he's still with us today, so. There's, there's yeah. a storytelling aspect to it, to be honest. Mm, and, for sure. Uh, you know, if you could go back in time, I know you said you didn't meet Orlinsky yourself, uh, Rob, but mm -hmm. uh, oh, to be a fly on the wall if you had uh, Tominsky and Orlinsky in the room together and hear their stories. I mean, that must have been Oh, yeah. no, that'd that be really fascinating. Great. And we do actually occasionally still have veterans uh, visit the um, mm -hmm. the museum. I think when you were actually uh, over, there was that one gentleman yeah. there, Mark Zostowski, mm -hmm. which he actually sadly, unfortunately, passed away yeah. recently. Yeah, so recently. rest in peace. Thank you for your service. Um, but yeah, he actually donated a lot of his stuff to mm -hmm. our museum. So we're actually going to go through that. So that's actually yeah. another project. Right. Another project. Yeah. <laughs> the nature of collections, it doesn't stop. Yeah, yeah. It, never, it never ends. It never ends. Um, um, and, and you wanted to also touch on uh, an, another Mississauga connection to uh, to Polish Canadians. and. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So we didn't we didn't actually talk about him in this um, exhibit, 
but we thought that um, it was just a really great story. Um, so you're getting the exclusive content here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Rob, Rob can talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, the person uh, that we're gonna talk about is uh, Janusz Zurakowski. So he has uh, quite a um, connection to the saga, but just a bit about his life. He was uh, born in Poland. Uh, that's where he trained to be a pilot at uh, this one school called Dembley. And that was actually the major school where a lot of the Polish pilots uh, mm -hmm. uh, trained. Okay. And um, yeah, so he joined uh, the Polish squadrons and at the start of the second war, um, as this common story of Poland falls, and then he escapes uh, to France um, through Romania and he joins uh, the Polish fighter squadron there in France and then he makes his way to the to England. Um, but I think uh, during the, um, World War II, Zhurkowski had a bit of an ace status. Like he um, was able to knock down two of the Luftwaffe planes. Um, and he was actually also a uh, commander in, one, in some of the squadrons. But the one thing that's really interesting is one of the squadrons that he was in, I think it was squadron number six, it was with a gentleman called Potocki. Uh, but this was which was also a test, well, he was a fighter plane, but he was also a test pilot with Zhurikovsky in the Avro era as well. Yeah, right. yeah, so later on in life. Later on in life. Yeah. But yeah, after the war, he went, he stayed in England. Um, he um, joined the Avro era or Avro there. And then he came to Canada. Um, the Avro era was in Malton here. And then he was a test pilot. And he he was uh, the uh, test pilot for the CF-105, which was one of the very important ones. So I think he was actually the first one to actually test that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then he worked with Vladislav Kutotsky there as well. So it's just a nice connection that both of them, yeah. you know, fought in the Second World War, and then they come back together in other testing planes in Canada. Yeah, a bit of a romance there. Kind of romance <laughs> going on there. So I thought that was uh, really interesting. And then actually, I just recently learned from you that they actually named a trail um after him here in Mississauga was called uh Jan's Trail, Jan's Trail. Yeah. Which I actually didn't know until you let yeah. me know. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, it's and you've gone to see it, so you know it's real. Yeah. <laughs> um and, and we had the, the interesting one where there's only a couple of uh, uh of uh places in Mississauga that are named after an individual's first name. Um Jan's Trail being one and there's another park down on Lakeshore Road called Richard's Memorial Park where they're named after the first name of an individual. Usually it's a surname and uh, part of the reason for the first names in both of these cases were people had difficulty with the Polish surname uh, in terms of its pronunciations. Uh, and so the, the, those, those recognitions are on their landscape and they're a story into it themselves, I think. And it's kind of a fascinating thing. I always think maybe this is, we can put this as an, an out there, if, if you don't mind my, a, a moment of my uh, reflection here. Um, uh, Potocki, uh, uh, Spud as he was known, or yeah, Spud, yeah. uh, Vladislav Potocki. Um, Jan gets the credit and, and he's the, the poster child for really the, the Avro arrow. Yeah. But uh, Potocki flew more in the arrows than Jan did. Jan retired mid program and retired up to Barry's Bay, Ontario, where yeah. Potocki was with the program for most of its run and, and flew more time in the Avro arrow than in any other pilot. Nice. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would say we, we've now honored Jan Zurakowski, so perhaps uh, uh, Spud Potocki is, uh, is, down, is, is on the yeah. list there for another name. <laughs> yeah, but, sure. um, and was, yeah, and I would actually want to do more research on Potocki. Like, I did look into it a bit, but I think he has a very, like, interesting story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well. yeah we, ha we have more artifacts that are associated with Zurakowski, which is why we more focus on him. But, yeah, no. Um, but yeah, his, his story and uh, you know his friendship with Potocki is uh, is definitely really interesting. Yeah, so yeah much better um, to go through. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I mean I don't know. There's so many things that um, are kind of you know named after Jerkowski and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were recently at Barry's Bay, and yeah. um, there was a whole park dedicated yeah. to him, and it has um, you know the a uh, model, a scaled down model yeah. of the Avro Arrow. It has like a statue of him and everything. Um, and that's in Barry's Bay. And then um, I, there's also, I, I wanted to bring it today, I forgot, but there is a book, a children's book yeah. that's all, actually called The Great Zura, and it's about him. Um, and it's so cute. I love it. But um, I did a re little reading of it on our Instagram, so you can yeah. find it there. So we'll, yeah. send that, we'll send that link. People can go to your Instagram and, yeah, no, and for have a sure. story. 
for yeah, sure. It's a very great book. And actually, mm-hmm. I think it was made last year, actually. And okay, I, okay. I came across it. And I'm like, I have to get this. Yeah. Yeah. And they were actually going like really quick. So I'm like, oh, thank God I was able to get one copy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're going like hotcakes. <laughs> yeah. Which was very surprising. It must have been very popular. And yeah. He's a popular guy. <laughs> Now let's uh, we can close and bring it back to the museum itself. I know we talked about the Instagram, but uh, um, tell me some stories of the museum and their collections. Like, do you have some favorite things in the museum uh, that people you know you think should come and see at some point when we're allowed to come and see? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, my personal favorite is um, a mandolin banjo. It, um so it's like kind of yeah. yeah um and it was owned by this um veteran named Anthony Troja and uh, he, he played it while he was in Scotland um when he was in the military police um and of course then he came to Canada and you know um and he brought it with him and stuff um but it's so cute like I don't know I just like love it um and we have a photo of him playing it and everything so and we even have the receipt, and so we can see how much he paid for it. Like I, I don't oh. know, I get really nerdy over that stuff. I think that's- <laughs> yeah, and it's really cool because what came with that uh, banjo, uh, the knowledge it was like a whole album of him and his squad, and there's just so many pictures of him playing mm-hmm. uh, uh, the mandolin yeah. banjo, and it's just very nice. Like during tough times, you know, they try to put some music in their lives, some yeah. entertainment. Yeah. So well, from, from the theme of remembrance and, and service and, you know, gratitude to those that serve, regardless of where they're from, um, we, we, we tend to look at, you know, the military involvement, the battles, the, the fallen soldiers, uh, not necessarily life during those times of a soldier uh, or of yeah. a military person. And maybe that tells a story that, you know, that, that's worthy of remembrance in its own right in terms of, of uh, you know, everyday life, finding comfort in times of yeah. trouble. Uh, yeah well there's this other um children's book that um i got recently um called the soldier bear um i can't remember exactly who it's by now um but uh it's about wojtek the bear who was um a a mascot for the polish um military Uh, i can't remember which unit it was now but anyways um but they they basically found this abandoned bear and they adopted it like it's kind of like a polish winnie the pooh yeah, and <laughs> yeah. i was gonna say <laughs> yeah yeah they, yeah they gave him a rank and everything he was yeah. i think a private to boy neck i think he was part of these supply units i think they had yeah. him, like carry some units yeah yeah, some yeah. Supplies yeah they over. had him carry carry things yeah. along the line so there was i believe one battle that he fought in yeah <laughs> yeah i yeah, know but it's very cute because you know they, there's pictures of him when he's small, but then he's mm-hmm. gradually getting bigger, and it's just yeah, yeah, yeah you bring so a lot cute. of joy to the poor soldiers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so and that's, and that's the thing. I mean, they would have dogs and cats around, uh, Wojtek, um, and you know, and musical instruments. Um, there's pictures of them playing cards. Um, just yeah. all all different types of things. So they're just trying to have you know this this moment of like levity and just be happy in the moment i guess you could say actually one of my favorite things just recently i was scanning uh stuff about uh one of the gentlemen that actually founded baba vila uh, his name was michael kaminek and there's actually photographs of him i think it was in um scotland while he was training during the second world war and he's like doing magic tricks yeah He's just doing magic. He's like practicing magic, yeah. and that's how he's entertaining the soldiers. And like he's got it. like a top hat, and I think he's got like a bunny and everything. I'm like, wow, that's a very interesting hobby you got there. Yeah, yeah, it's you really know. cute. But yeah, but also too, not um one one thing that I also wanted to say is like not every um person that we talk about is even necessarily like a soldier, you know. Yeah. Um. So I think so. Rob was going to say yeah. about his favorite um object. Um, which was from someone who wasn't even a soldier. Yeah, so uh, one of my favorite artifacts is, uh, comes from this uh, woman called Maria Vronska. So Maria Vronska was a resident at uh, Bao Vila. And uh, so what she donated was a um, fork and a um, spoon. So at first glance, it just seems like normal utensils, but then when you turn it around, there's actually a Nazi symbol. So then we uh, found out that she was actually in prison in one of the concentration camps in Poland during the Second World War for political reasons. And we actually have a document that actually states that. 
Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting because I myself, I never seen any kind of artifacts from a concentration camp from Poland. And it's actually really nice to actually see that in this museum in Mississauga. So mm -hmm. it's one of my favorite stories that I like to tell. And we actually have it on display right now. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It's, it, I, and it's kind of, I, I don't want to say, I don't know if scary is the right word, but yeah. like, you know, you're just thinking it's like a normal, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a knife mm -hmm. or it's a fork, you know, yeah. whatever. And then you turn around, you're like, oh, no, no. Yeah. So it's really, I don't know, it just, it really kind of, that's yeah, well very powerful sets kind of in. thing. It, yeah, it's just yeah, like, it's powerful. Just like that one, it's yeah. just, you know, two things that can tell such a story of someone's experience at a place. I think that's very mm -hmm, touching. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree entirely. Now, if, if I can jump in with my own favorite, if you don't mind. Uh, although the models are exceptional, and I can stare at the plane models and the ship models that you have <laughs> on display there. The propeller is a fascinating one. Yes. Uh, you yeah. might be the only museum that I've been to in, in the local GTA that has a giant wooden propeller on display. <laughs> and, um, I, I mean, yeah, we don't have to explore it so much. I, I almost want to leave it hanging there to let people come and see these things for themselves. Yeah, um, for sure. It, it's, uh, you know, you have an incredible collection and um, I, needless to say, I think you could probably fill twice the space that you already have. Uh, at least, yeah. um, but uh, you know, here is a museum that is uh, unique in the city, uh, if not unique in the GTA and unique in Canada from its, its particular uh, scope. But it's right here in Mississauga. It's on Clarkson Road. It's uh, uh, you know a hidden gem, if you will. And uh, you know, unfortunately, COVID is going to make it remain hidden for a little bit. Um, but uh, hopefully, through Instagram, and then once things reopen, we can we can connect, and people can come and see and and, and visit the collections you have. And uh, yeah. I think those are are you know what you have is powerful, and the stories you have are powerful. And uh, um, you know, in part thanks to the connection to our boys, we're telling those stories that we don't necessarily have an avenue to tell. Um, and uh, hopefully, this is the beginning of of uh, of even bigger and brighter things moving forward for the museum. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah I know we always uh, like to um, you know, shake our, showcase our exhibitions throughout the saga. This is actually, I think, our third outreach exhibition here in Mississauga. So it's actually really mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. so, just well, just in the time that we've been like kind of with them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. really great. So yeah. we're very thankful. Well, let's yeah. look at doing more. Not that you're not busy enough, but we'll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And we have more planned. We do have more planned. Yeah. We won't give it, give that away. That's a way down the road. But we do have more stuff planned. So yeah, yeah, we're well, trying we'll, to get out there. We'll talk too. We'll do some. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. But, uh, thank you for joining us here. Thank you for exploring uh, the uh, the museum with us and the collections and the connections to our boys. Um, fascinating stories and, uh, and and something we look forward to sharing with residents of Mississauga uh, in, in the days ahead, however long this current situation lasts with us, but uh, uh, there, will be, there will be a time when the doors will open again and uh, people yeah. can visit and see. So thank you so much for taking the time and joining us and uh, exploring the collections with us. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thank you uh, for the uh, for joining us this week, Darren, on Ask a Historian, and uh, we're joined. Uh, Darren Wybenga is the traditional knowledge keeper and land use coordinator at Mississaugas of the Credit River First Nation, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Darren, once again uh, for, for joining us. And uh, this week for an exploration on uh, connections to uh, war and remembrance at uh, at, at New Credit, um, and. Uh, we ha you have a talk coming up uh, on uh, on Saturday, November 14th with the Museums of Mississauga as part of the Our Boys and War Flowers program. And so uh, we'll, we'll put some links up at the end of the program for oh, that. Good. Um, but uh, always look forward to sharing stories and, uh, and wandering down memory lane with you, Darren. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to be here. I don't mind doing it either as far as that goes. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to the talk on, I think, the 14th, like you said. Yeah, 14th, yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. So, so it's still a little bit away. That's good too, but uh, always good to have extra prep time. <laughs> always, always. You can't. That never hurts. That never hurts.
So one of the, like, uh, I, I'm fascinated to learn about our uh, Indigenous veterans and Indigenous fallen that are connected to the Mississaugas. And uh, uh, I know, uh, for example, at uh, the New Credit, uh, uh, there is the memorial that you have. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the memorial and, uh, and uh, kind of the services that usually take place there around Remembrance. I'm not sure this year is going to be usual, but... Oh. Um, uh, wonder if you can tell us about the the, um, uh, the memorial itself, and we'll show some pictures here as well. Oh, well, I'm glad you have pictures because I was thinking about that earlier. No, this year we're gonna it's gonna be uh, just a very simple uh, simple session on Facebook, a Facebook video. I think it's gonna take five minutes. Our remembrance of the veterans. Usually we gather behind our council house on the First Nation. There we have our memorial. It's in the it's not the, what you call a cenotaph, as you normally remember, the big granite type of stones. This is a burial mound. It's an earthen mound and with a path around it and four granite tablets, four directions, each with uh, each uh, laden with the veterans' names on it. And uh, surrounding this memorial is also three, three pillars with granite flames on them, signifying the the Three Fires Confederacy that we as the Mississauga Nation belong to. Uh, if you remember in history, we belong to that Confederacy, including, uh, we're Ojibwe, of course, so we're in with the Potawatomi people and the Adawa people in that Confederacy. So it's a bit of really, really ancient history for us going back to this Confederacy. And then in the inner circle of our memorial, it's the modern, uh, uh, well, maybe not all that modern because I, if you've seen it, uh, you'll know we look after our veterans all the way from the War of 1812 to uh, to the peacekeepers that we have now. Uh, so anybody that we know that has served from that time on, if we can find out your name, we will put it right on our memorial. And we're adding names continually. Oh wow! Uh, so so it's it's always a work in progress for us. Uh, so right now. We just recently added a couple peacekeepers last year, but uh, let me think about this. I think right now we have two War of 1812 uh, veterans. We have, oh, geez, now I've got to get my conflicts in order all of a sudden. Uh, we, funny thing is we don't have anybody from the Rebellion of 1837, the Upper Canada Rebellion. Uh, we're pretty sure we were involved there too. I'm sure. But nothing, but, but nothing official yet for us. Uh, the next, uh, we have the American Civil War. Two of our band members were involved in that. We have uh, the Boer War. I should say what the second Boer War is the correct term for, for that. One member for that. Our only casualty, our only member and our only casualty in that conflict. Uh, we have uh, World War II, of course. Uh, 30, 32, no, 36 band members uh, part, uh, participated and... Uh, 36 names, 32 for World War II, uh, three Korean uh, uh, conflict members. And I think we're in the range, I'd have to check my notes again, but probably 26 peacetime service members. So, you know, I, I, I like to think we're a peaceful people, but really in that, usually when there's been a conflict, we've somehow been involved in it. Uh, it's, a, it's a source of pride. Yeah. But it's also maybe, you know, a source of sadness too, with all this conflict going on through the years. But okay. at least I can usually say if, if there's been a new credit band member in the major incidents in, in Canada's uh, military history. I was going to say, I don't know your, your, your population makeup or demographics or, or size or whatever the right term is, but, you know, given that number of participants over time, and I, I know the population is not a, a massive population. You're looking at a good percentage of your of your population who are stepping forward to serve in times of conflict. Uh, I, overall, I would think. Oh, we did quite well. I can I can really speak better to World War One. I. I think we had 282 band members in uh, eight, uh, pardon me 1914, and if we sent out, I think 36 what it is what I said. We were at I believe 11 percent which is slightly higher than the Canadian average. I think the Canadian average was eight. Yeah. If that, that sounds right to me. Yeah. And so not all of them made it over there, of course. Uh, so, you know, a few did make it overseas for whatever they got ill before they actually made it over there. And, uh, 
But yeah, that's a significant percentage. And these are your able-bodied men of the First Nation. So all of a sudden they're not out tending the farm because we're primarily an agricultural community in those days. So we're not getting the farm work done uh, in the way that we uh, normally did. So it was a significant percentage. I'm not sure what the population is for World War, the World War II period. I'm guessing somewhere around 500. I'm, and, and that really is a guess. Uh, I don't think I've seen any Indian Affairs record yet that gives me a precise uh, a precise count. But it's something for me to go and look out for. In that percentage, I mean, you're dealing. Think of from the. I'm, I'm thinking from the social perspective of the community itself. You know, if your family member isn't connected, you knew somebody who was. Like this is. Oh. Like it just uh, and the, and the fallout of casualties. I think you said. Uh, you told me four casualties from the First World War, is that correct? Yeah, four casualties from the First World War. Uh, yeah, it was, that, how do I say, it? when you read about World War I, you're relieved that you only lost four people. When you think about, uh, and the two, ca and the, you know, uh, the best Second Battle of Ypres was the one that killed uh, Lieutenant Cameron Brandt, He's one of our, uh, what shall I say, one of our, one of our more important veterans. I don't like putting one veteran higher than the other, yeah. but he's uh, very representative. He's he has uh, connections to Six Nations, of course. He's you can tell by the name of Brant. He's the great great grandson of uh, Joseph Brant, the the Mohawk war chief uh, that fought for the British during the uh, Revolution. So he's got representatives of Six Nations. He's a New Credit Band member. He was a resident of Hamilton when he was killed. And he was a member, of course, a resident of Brant County. So he's got all these things going on. And so he's kind of an important for that, uh, for that reason. Uh, so he represents a lot of people in that sense. And uh, yeah, he, he was kind of, uh, yeah, he was one of our brightest and best. Uh, and he, got, he gets taken down in this, this nasty battle, at, and it was only what I think the twenty third of April. I think that was the second day of that, or is that the first day of the battle? Second day of the battle, and he, that was it. You know, fighting a, you know, fighting back, take, you know, a raid back against the Germans on that uh, in that particular battle. Did, uh, do you do you have any uh, any knowledge or information of how the community uh, received the news and or look to commemorate him uh, at the time? I mean, that's uh, going back in time looking at, at other other material, but... Right. Uh, the community... I'm going to... Well, put it this way. I can tell you how his wife found out about it. His Both Cameron and his wife, uh, Flossie, her name was Flossie or Florence, Florence Phillips, that's her maiden name, were living in Spring Street in Hamilton at the time. He, just before the war started, he moved to Hamilton to, to take up a job as a sheet metal worker. Okay. So they're living on Spring Street. He, he enlists right away in 1914, which is very unusual. A First Nation man enlisting in the early days of World War I and off straight away. Uh, he's over there. He gets killed in the Second Battle of Eat. His wife finds out about this. She's taking letters from her apartment down to the postman. She's writing letters to Cameron Brent, and she's taking them down to the, I suppose it's the mailbox, and dropping them off at the mailbox. By the time she comes home, there is a messenger waiting for her. And of course, she gets the bad news that he's been killed in battle. And... She was just devastated. I'm very glad to hear that she had her sister-in-law with her at the time to kind of help her get through that. Yeah. If you see Cameron Brent's service file, oh my goodness, the amount of work she went through to try and get his personal effects is unbelievable. She's constantly writing and getting no answer. Finally, she does, however, uh, you know, achieve, uh, get, some, get some satisfaction that way. Uh, and I'm assuming the people at New Credit either learned about this in the Brantford reporting and the Brantford papers from nearby, or maybe she phoned down here. I, I don't know. I've never heard how the actual community found out. 
Uh, right away, though, uh, at uh, the end of the war, 1919, council votes, votes to put a marble plaque inside our church, I mean, you know, New Credit United Church, and it's still there to this day, along with our other casualty that died overseas, uh, Maxwell, Maxwell Tobikov uh, is his name, and he died a few years after Cameron Brandt. Uh, that's, a, that's a good segue because I wanted to bring up, uh, and, and at the end of this segment, we're going to run a, a YouTube link for anyone who's interested, but uh, a few years ago, you did a, uh, a video with The Great War Attic on uh, a poetry book, Comes Home, about the, the uh, a book that belonged to Lieutenant uh, Cameron Brandt. Right. Um, and uh, you also mentioned about uh, medals that he received. I'm just wondering if you can give us kind of a brief, how, how the poetry book came to you and, and how you got <coughs> medals and... Uh, and then after this, this uh, uh, after this segment, we'll uh, post the link for anyone who wants to uh, to see that uh, the, the video itself. It was really well done. Right. The, uh, okay. The poetry book. I was sitting in the library because I served as a librarian too for the First Nation, doing some work over there, and somebody phoned me out of nowhere from the town of Picton, Ontario. She was a seller of used, kind of like a rummage sale store, secondhand goods. It was some charity type of store, anyway. <laughs> And she said, uh, she phoned me up, uh, would you like a book from, from Cameron Brandt? And I'm thinking, okay, sure, cautiously, okay, sure. What do you mean? She goes, it's, it's, it's got his name in the front cover. And I said, well, sure, send it. And I was all excited to think, okay, maybe we finally got something. And uh, it came in the mail a couple days later, well, actually about a couple weeks later, and I opened it up and it had a certain enough, Cameron D. Brandt uh, gave a date, gave the camp that he was at, and I thought, boy, this looks like the real thing. Now I gotta go check to see if, if it's actually his writing. Yeah. And sure enough, I got out the attestation paper and checked the signature, and lo and behold, it was Cameron Brandt's. Wow. Uh, and the book was Songs of a Sourdough, one of those Robert's W. Service uh, books of poetry. You yeah. know, the poems, Strange Things Done. In, uh, Sam McGee, you probably learned the cremation of Sam McGee when you were yeah. uh, a little kid. Yeah. And so we, so that happened. So, boy, we got something tangible from Cameron Brandt. No kidding. A couple weeks later, I was sitting in the library again, and I got a call from the band office saying, come over here. There's a man that wants you to wants to give you some military medals for the library. And I'm thinking, oh boy, this is great, okay. Never even thought about Cameron Brandt, but I'll go and talk to this gentleman. And so I'm over there and he hands me this, it was basically, uh, what do you call it? A sandwich bag full of medals. Okay. Not, not full of, well, you know. There was, uh, there was the death, uh, dead man's penny in there. I, well, they called them uh, the memorial plaque. They call it, I think, is its real name. Yeah. Uh, and so it has its name, Cameron Brandt, right there. And I'm thinking, holy cow, the book a couple weeks earlier, yeah. now the medals. So really, we hit the mother load. And the interesting thing is about this is the guy that brought them had found them while he was renovating a house near Selkirk, Ontario. And he found them secreted in a mantle. Now, the funny thing is, the mantle normally would have stayed at the house. He was just renovating it. He's going to leave it. But then he asked the owner of the house, listen, can I take that mantle with me? I like it. So he's taking the mantle apart, and he finds these metals hidden in them, in there. And for the left minute, I couldn't think of how they got there, and he couldn't think of how they got there. And so I said, well, whose, whose property was it before? And the name was Smith. I thought, oh, that's, well, that's interesting. I'm grateful to have the medals. Thank you very much. And then I thought, well, you know, how am I going to find out about this? I decided to look up Floss, uh, Flossie Florence, his wife's. If she ever got married again, just out of curiosity. And sure enough, she did. The man's name was Walter Smith. So now I had my Smith connection. Why they were hid, I, you know, I'll never know. 
but there the medals were. We have them. We have them now, and we're grateful to uh, to have them. Another very tangible thing with uh, with Cameron Brandt, you know. Do you, do you, did you similarly were you able to trace the poetry of how it uh, ended up in Picton? You know, I I really don't know. I didn't see any of that listed in the service file and his effects. Right. Uh, I'm still leaning that's probably what happened. It came in the personal effects. But then I got thinking as well, well, what if one of his buddies picked it up? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he saw this lieutenant reading it. Well, I'll take it. He's not going to use it anymore. Yeah. Uh, and what I love about that poetry book so much is because uh, First Nations people were seen as very bloodthirsty vicious warrior types out on the battlefield and it was painted that way in the media and even the Germans looked at them uh, I think it was the minister of the militia at the time who was it Sir Sam Hughes yeah said something to the effect no I don't want uh, first well, he said Indians Indians in the war right away because the Germans won't extend them the rules of civilized warfare so we better not do that and here you have a very a very civilized man reading poetry very, very not First Nations reading poetry in his downtime on the front. I said, and you can extrapolate things from that. Uh, probably educated, probably literate, probably well spoken. Oh, probably exactly. <laughs> like I said before, he's probably one of our very, very best and brightest that uh, that was taken from us. Who knows what he would have been? What what he, what he would have done? Uh, I think. He, might have been a good candidate for chief one day if he would have uh, been able to stay around. I always say that's the, when you look at the uh, veterans names uh, of the fallen, I said it's not just that life ended. Um, there's, there's a good chance that it's a family that's ended because either they uh, were, yet, were not yet married or did not have a chance to raise children. Um, it, it, it's the end of, it's not just the end of one line, it's the end of a, end of a larger story. And uh, right. uh, you think of the young ladies in the community that might have uh, gone on to, to have families and, and with these individuals that never had that chance. And so you, you don't know, right? Like, like it's almost you like really the, don't. The society changes course when it when does. we're lost. And, uh, it does. Uh, how old was he when, when, he, when, he, when he fell? Uh, let me see, 1887 to uh, 1950. And oh boy, you wouldn't know I understand that. Taught math before. Twenty-eight. Uh, Thirteen plus fifteen, right? Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Yeah. Well, twenty-eight. Uh, and had no children, and he'd been married at this time for about three years. I think he was married in nineteen eleven. So, you know, I don't know. You, it's one of those things. Yeah, you'll never know again. And uh, Flossie, his wife, went on, like I said, and got married again, and ended up having a family. So. It, 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 you know, it, prime of life, beginning of life. I mean, you know, you establish yourself. And like I said, he took a job in Hamilton, probably to better his circumstances from a finance perspective. And, uh, and but, but stepping forward when the country calls. And, and I, I know we're in a, in, in a, 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 I don't know what the right words to say, but an, an age of reconciliation and right. an understanding of, 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 uh, cultural divides and, and, you know, how we bring people together and, uh, and, and walk forward together. I think the, the, the term is uh, walking the same path side by side, something like that. Right. That the case when Cameron stepped forward. I mean, this was, you know, for whatever compelled him uh, and others to serve, uh, they were living in a world that was not, uh, did not see them necessarily as equal citizens. Um, exactly. I thought it kind of strange Canada at the end of World War War World War One is looking for more equality with the rest of the world, trying to get under the shadow of the British uh, British Empire. You know, more equality, more autonomy, and it was exactly in my to my way of thinking what the First Nations were fighting for in a large sense at that time. They also had to try and prove their worth, and so that they could have a greater autonomy and equality with the. No, we know, of course, that didn't work too well because, you know, we're, here we are, 2020, and we're still, we're still working at it anyway, but at least it was a step forward.
Uh, yes, uh, um, uh, with a cost as well, of course. But but right. yeah, step four. Now, if we could step forward a bit to, uh, I, I'm doing bad segues today. I apologize. Oh, that's all. That's all. <laughs> yeah. you, you had mentioned uh, uh, relatively recently the loss of a, a 95 year old veteran in your community, um, uh, uh, Bill Tobico. I think you said. Yeah, that? Bill Tobico, William Tobico. I think he's known as just generally known as Bill around here. Yeah, he just recently died in 2018. He was our last uh, veteran from the Second World War. Uh, he actually lived in Utah. He, he lived in New Credit for his early years and just shortly after World War II ended, he lived here for a few years, but then he went elsewhere. But our last veteran, and just before, he's di just before he died, his children thought it would be a good idea to get some of his memories down on, uh, for posterity. And so they did a number of tapings with them. And uh, you could tell, of course, if you were 94 years old, you're, you're gonna have a mind full of memories. And I think sometimes trying to reach in and pull out some of these memories can be a bit of a chore sometimes. I'm only in my uh, 50s and I have trouble enough time pulling out, uh, pulling out memories. So anyway, yeah, so he's, he, he's 94. He's doing these interviews in bed of all things. And he tells this story, which, you know, uh, and the story, he was an artilleryman. That was his uh, role. And he was in Belgium, as far as I could tell from the interviews they conducted. And so very, very cold in Belgium in this winter. I don't have a date for it. And I don't have an exact location. This is just the man's memories. And they had to stop for the night and find some place to hole up. So they stop in a, where there's a little broken down shack in the countryside. It's falling apart, really. I don't even know if the word shack does it any justice. He kind of describes it as broken down with maybe only two walls <laughs> standing up and a bunch of boards. And so they're gonna stay in there for the night. And so he goes in, he describes how they put the camouflage netting on the floor to kind of put their sleeping bags on, keep them off the ground. And he describes how they had ammunition boxes. I'm sure you've seen them before, the metal ammunition boxes. And they're using these as ovens. So they build a fire. They're taking slats of wood from this broken shed, putting it in the ammunition box, starting a fire, and heating hot, heating rocks. And they're going to warm up those rocks. And once they're warm, they put them in the bottom of the sleeping bag. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And that keeps them nice and cozy for the night. And so that's what he and uh, he and his buddies did. The next night, they're warm and they're alive, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, but just a couple hundred yards away, uh, there were other Canadian soldiers that had stopped for the night in trucks. The, in the morning, they were found frozen to death in their trucks. Oh, God. Okay. And that was just a couple hundred yards away. And I think, you know, I can already imagine taking these bodies out of the truck and moving them off for burial or whatever happened for them. And that was just within a couple hundred yards of where these guys, uh, you know, were, were relatively warm for the night. So... Uh, the fortunes of war, you know, what more can you, uh, can you say? They weren't even brain shot at, it's just the climate that got, yeah, yeah. that got those fellows. But to have those memories from, I mean, kudos to the family for, uh, for doing that. Uh, even if they don't tell a, a, you know, a strict narrative per se of, of, of time overseas, to have the memories from the community of someone who, who served can be a really valuable thing for storytelling and, uh, and remembrance. Oh, exactly. We don't have a lot of stories that come down to us, you know. That was just one of the very, very few that we have. Uh, we have another one that comes to us, and I'm, I have to investigate this a little bit more from the Dieppe raid. Uh, we had a number of our band members participate in that raid. We had one taken prisoner and two killed in the Dieppe raid. And... Uh, the one fellow's name is uh, Max King. Uh, he, he he's a New Credit band member. He joins the Royal Hamilton, I think the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, 
And they're one of the units that, of course, attacked on that day, attacked those fortified positions in the French port of Dieppe. And uh, he's with his brother. Anyway, the story comes down how he was killed. Uh, apparently right, right beside our other band member that was killed at Dieppe. So you got these two band members relatively close together, seen by the brother, and they're both killed right then and there within a few meters of each other. So a devastating day for New Credit anyway, probably the most devastating day for, in terms of warfare anyway, for our First Nation. And the funny thing is, Max, Max, uh, Max wrote a wonderful little report for a paper called the Pine Tree Chief at the time. And that report came out in January of uh, who was it? 1942. Eight months later, he's dead in August for the Dieppe parade. And he tells of his enthusiasm for joining up. Oh. Uh, it's one of these things where, boy, oh boy, we're excited. We got the uniforms. We're feeling, we're feeling tough. Uh, we're excited. We thought the war was going to end before we got over there. Uh, we see the old veterans from the previous war while we're here in England and you know, they're impressed and they, and they went for the adventure. He admits it as much. And, and then it comes to this bad end in, uh, in Dieppe. Uh, and the funny thing is he just got married a couple months earlier. He dies with an unborn son. Uh, so, and the interesting thing about that is that, uh, the, the widow, She's only been married for, what, uh, a couple months. She moves to Canada, and she moves to the First Nation and marries one of the brothers that actually stayed home during the war. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, and the son was eventually adopted by that brother. So it's one of those interesting kind of what we got, I guess, I, I call it a war bride story coming over here. I can't imagine the culture shock for her coming from England. Uh, she, she, wor she worked as a nanny for an, up for an upper class family in England. So I'm sure she was fairly prim and proper and knew how to do everything just right and then come over to the probably what was seen as the wilds of Canada and living on her Indian Reserve, uh, no less, and trying to uh, learn that. Well, if you, th if, you th if you think about it in general terms, that's 100 years after Eliza Field Jones did the exact same thing. And yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. That, that, I never thought about that before, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the culture shock all around uh, in a way. But also, you know, what does that bring to the community? Because you said, the, you know, an unborn child who now is raised in at New Credit um, and, and then goes on to contribute significantly to that community, right? Is that the well, yeah, Max, of course, was a, Max, uh, Max Elliot King was his, uh, was his son and goes on to become an educator in the nearby, uh, in, the, in the area of nearby town of Kugge. He's the, I think it was the vice principal there, principal at Hagersville High School, principal at our school on the reserve, uh, did all kinds of work with government and hospital boards. So really a contributing member to, uh, to society. So, uh, you know, Max, Max uh, Senior, I guess, I guess we'd call it. Uh, yeah, he, we thank him for his service and now the service of his son. Yeah. But just to remark, you know, where fate could have been if, if the mother had decided not to come. I mean, like the- uh, Exactly. What compelled her to go to, uh, to Canada? She must have, must have dearly loved this man yeah. and dearly loved the family. I can imagine him sharing stories with her about her family, what life was like in, uh, in Canada. And, uh, for for uh, individuals like Max, who, were, who was killed overseas at Dieppe, um, I'm, I'm presuming that they are buried in some of the Commonwealth cemeteries over there, the soldier cemeteries? And yes, I have somewhere along the line, I do have a picture of that. Uh, of that yeah he's buried over there i think the other fellow his uh norman henry was the other fellow's name that was killed uh i think he's buried over there as well in one of those cemeteries our world war one casualties are no sign of those folks of course 
because of, uh, well, you know how things got pulverized in the in World War One. Their names are on the Menin Gate in uh, right. in Belgium. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and. Is, it, is there anything identifying them as as uh, as indigenous uh, on the on the gravestones? Uh, as I recall, there's nothing. Oh, yeah. There's nothing at all. Matter of fact, even here on New Credit, uh, I forget the government of Canada put up a number of stones for veterans too, yeah. and there's nothing at all that identifies them at it, all yeah. as uh, indigenous people. You just see the the usual uh, was it the maple leaf in the circle, yeah. the name, the unit number. And the dates. They're, they're, they're soldiers of Canada. Exactly. Exactly. They're, they're soldiers of Canada. Yes. But I, and I, I don't know. But kudos, would, would they have wanted to be identified as Indigenous? That's what I'm always curious about, too. Right. How did they see themselves fighting? Did they see themselves as, in the case of World War I, uh, soldiers of the British Empire? Did they see themselves as Canadians? Did they see themselves as... Uh, citizens of new credit for lack of better word how did they view themselves in the grand scheme of things yeah you know i i really don't uh, don't know about that i often wonder if it's our generation that looks back to apply or try to make sense and apply uh, a terminology to previous generations uh, in a sense because in many cases i know from from, from my community's perspective um, we don't often have those personal letters that have their own views on on the world and, and their place in it. So, um, yeah, they, they they enlisted with the Canadian forces, but they wanted to serve, and there was probably no other option for service, right? So this is there really wasn't. Uh, uh, you yeah, have some of our band. Uh, I think one of our band member in I'm trying to think of the name. Oh, his name escapes me right now. Uh, Henry, I think, isn't it? Norman Henry, the fellow that was killed yep. in uh, the Dieppe raid. His brother was also killed just at uh, VE Day. Okay. And he was, uh, let me say, he was serving with the American Air Force at the time. Okay. So that might have been his way to kind of escape Canada or do something, do something more exciting than uh, <laughs> be in the Army anyway. At least he got to fly <laughs> and drop, and, you know, maybe that's a little more exciting. But we did have soldiers that did uh, join up with the Americans. From what I understand, too, there's a lot of, a lot of Americans that joined up in Canada, too, to, uh, to have a go at uh, Germany at the time. I, I remember a, a quote from a, um, a, 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 a recruiting officer that was preserved in our community, and uh, uh, the, the bad, bad segue for the story was basically a, a younger man uh, wanting, to, uh, wanting to enlist but was underage. And uh, he was refused and he was crying outside and an officer came, put his hand around and said, what's wrong, son? And he said, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm underage. And, you know, how old are you? He goes, I'm 17. He goes, you're 18. Come with me. <laughs> <laughs> the moral of the story was if you wanted to serve, there was a way. Um, and so if you were an American and you wanted to be a soldier, there was a way. If you were, presumably if you were indigenous and you wanted to fly, there was a way. Um, it, it was it was a time, First and Second World War, where they were looking for soldiers. They were looking for for, for people, um, and so if you had that drive, there was a way to do it. And, uh, there was a way to. Uh, I left. We had two boy soldiers in World War One tried to join up. I think one was sixteen, the other was seventeen. And the funny thing is about them, they actually got an outfit, a uniform, the whole thing, and uh, their parents just did not want that to happen. And the funny, they write a letter to the Indian agent of all things, and he gets them off the hook. I'm sure the boys weren't too happy, Probably but the not. parents were terribly relieved. And the funny thing is both boys come home and get married within what, a year, year and a half? Yeah. So I don't know, there's a joke in there about service one way or service another, I don't know what it is, but. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, had, I had a personal family member in the Second World War who was desperate to enlist. He wanted to get off the farm, but he was considered an essential worker because he worked Yes, hard. yes. And uh, he went to uh, three different recruiting stations and refused at all three times <laughs> because he was deemed as an essential worker, but he was trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. But, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it just, it's a different time. Like we don't, 
like we were talking about percentage of volunteerism or, or, or at least percentage of involvement in your community and such a small population base to have, you know, 11, 12 percent of your population stepping forward to serve is just incredible. Um, but the motivation factors too, like uh, those are, you know, you said one was a sense of adventure and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, courage, service, whatever you want to say, but, but these people serve and to see your community today honoring all of those that served, regardless of the conflict that they served in, I think is just a real tribute to that, to, to, to new credit. Um, um, and, and the way your, your community chooses to remember and, and connect with, with the veterans. Because I'm assuming um, you have descendants, uh, you have family lines that are still active in that community that take, that come back to the, this war period. Um, oh, it's, it's funny. Uh, we have one family, the family of Albert Crane. He was a World War I uh, veteran. And it was really a big thing for them. Because they come back year after year to a visit our, do our war memorial uh, service. And the funny thing is, I think Albert started something in World War II because his son served and then his grandson eventually serves too. So you got three generations and each one kind of knowing what they were getting into because of the previous generation's experience. Right. Uh, I'm kind of always amazed with it, but really there's not a family here at New Credit that does not have some somebody that has served somewhere, whether it's in colonial wars yeah. or, you know, like the War of 1812 or whether it's World War One or World War Two, yeah. It's just, that's the way it, the way it is here. And, and like you said, I, like you said, this year remembrance is going to look different whether you're new predator or anywhere. I mean, we can't do the gatherings and uh, a little bit strange in my mentality to think about it. It's always been a tradition of ours to, uh, to go to remembrance day services and, uh, um, you know, I, it shouldn't, uh, we should still take that opportunity to remember. Um, I think so. Regardless of where we are and what we're allowed to do, uh, remembrance can be a moment of, for, for personal reflection and uh, uh, those that come. And, uh, and maybe we'll end on, on, a, on a segue to what, the, the 14th. Um, right. Where, uh, a presentation in greater detail with, with uh, a number of different stories than what we touched on here. Uh, we'll be at seven o'clock uh, at um, November 14th. If you go to the Mississauga Culture website, you'll find the link for the event. Uh, we'll post the link at the end here as well. And uh, we'll, uh, although we can't do the in-person programs, at least we can uh, do the virtual ones. And, uh, well, that's what we're with for the next uh, little while anyway. And who knows, maybe the stuff will, all this virtual stuff will be good for posterity. We'll actually have recordings of this stuff in the future. Maybe, maybe that'll be better than the paper. Maybe we don't have to write memoirs. We'll just keep talking. Yeah, well, that would be a way, wouldn't it? <laughs> that wouldn't be bad. I can see that. Well, thank you once again, Darren, for joining us. And uh, I always, I, I'm never sure on how to say, you know, uh, wish someone a well on Remembrance Day, but uh, yeah, it, it's never something to say happy Remembrance Day, but we, we certainly wish you well. Um, and thank you for joining us. And, uh, again, on the 14th, we'll have an opportunity to explore in greater detail uh, the connections between uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit and, uh, and, and conflicts uh, at home and overseas uh, over time. Um, but we look forward to, to exploring that. And hopefully down the road, whenever we're allowed, maybe we can come to a remembrance service at New Credit as well. And, and, uh, there again, people are always welcome to come and visit us here. Well, thank you, Darren, very much, and be well. Yeah, thank you very much.